Thank you. At this time, we are going to look, and our foundation starts with John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. And what I'd like to do to make sure that we cover the text is I'm going to read all 15 verses to us, and then we'll break it down. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool called Bethesda, in Hebrew, which had five covered porches. And within each of these laid a large number of sick, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time, stir the water, and then the first one who got in after the water had been stirred up recovered from whatever ailment he had. And one man was there who had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Sir, the sick man replied to Jesus, I don't have anyone, I don't have a man to put me in to the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Jesus told him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly the man got well. He picked up his mat and he started to walk. And now that day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man, Who has made you healed? Or who has healed you? And this is the Sabbath. It is illegal for you to pick up your mat. He replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up my mat and walk. Who is the man who told you, pick up your mat and walk? They asked him, but the man who was cured did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And after this, Jesus found this man and said to him, he was in the temple complex, see that you are well, do not sin anymore. And so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. God bless the reading of his word. In chapter 5, we see as the third sign that Jesus is performing here in the Gospel of John. And it's interesting, it's during the time of a festival that we're not really given the name of it, but we know that three festivals in the Bible, they are required as Jews to go up into Jerusalem. An easy way to remember this third miracle happened during one of the third, one of the three festivals. And so Jesus goes up because why? Jesus is a practicing Jewish believer in God. He never renounces Judaism. He is the fulfillment of it. And so Jesus goes up, and while he's there at that festival, we notice that he goes to an area that is called the Sheep Gate. I don't think it's by accident Jesus goes to the Sheep Gate because why? A shepherd is going to go to where the sheep are. Now these sheep are lame. These sheep are broken. These sheep are hurting. And what does the shepherd do? He sees these sheep without a shepherd and he has mercy on them. And so we need to understand is that the eye of Christ looks upon those not that are able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, you've heard that saying. Uh, Just man up. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get your life together. That might be easy for us to say, but my friends, I will tell you this. Ultimately, it is only God who can pull us up out of that pit that we're in. Now, you can have all the self-will, all the self-determination and the good thoughts and positive uh, vibes you want to have, but only Jesus can truly get you on your feet where you need to be. And so this shepherd by the name of Jesus, he comes there to the sheep gate in Jerusalem and there by this pool that the water was at called Bethesda. Now Bethesda is a Hebrew word, Beth we know, and Hebrew means house. And the remaining part of that word of Bethesda means mercy. And so when you put it together, Jesus shows up by a pool called the house of mercy. And what a fitting picture it is to have the good shepherd show up in front of all these broken sheep. And what does he do? He's about to show mercy upon one of them. 
Now we see in this text, it says that while he is there by the pool of Bethesda, there was a place that had five covered porches. And there are all these people, a large number of people that are sick, they're blind, they're lame, they're paralyzed. These are not people that typically you would want to hang out with. They have nothing to offer you. But notice Jesus doesn't go to people that have something to offer him. Jesus goes to individuals that he has something to offer to them. Amen. Oftentimes we befriend people, people that have something that can benefit us. And it's sad, isn't it, when we do that, whenever we just want to make friends say, well, I can befriend this person because they can help me at my work, or I can befriend this person because maybe I can use them on a, a job reference or a resume. Let me tell you this. Jesus goes to the social outcasts and offers himself. And the reason why is because they are the individuals that are in such desperate need. If the only people that you're befriending is fellow believers, then my friends, what does it say to the world? We need to reach out to those who are lost, spiritually lame, those who are spiritually blind, those who are spiritually crooked, those who are spiritually hurting, and that they need the same hope we have. And that only comes from Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying you befriend them and start committing the same sins that they commit. What I'm saying to you, my friends, is that the light that shines through you because of Jesus will shine into their life as well. And here we see Jesus goes and He sees all these people there. And what are they waiting on? Could it be a superstition? Could it actually be some form of healing that was taking place? What they were waiting on was a pool of water that is normally stagnant. It does not move. The pool of water that is there, they're waiting for something to happen to make it start moving. The legend of the Jewish writers that would have, they said there was an angel that would come in and do this. Let me say to you, just because something was happening did not necessarily mean it was of God. Let me just say that as well. So these people are seeking healing from this water that actually had no power to it and had no clue. If you're taking notes to me, this is a very important idea in this text that these people are seeking power from water that did not move on its own, not knowing that the one who offered the living water actually stepped in their midst. The living water of Christ walks in. The good shepherd walks through the, through the sheep gate. All of these imageries are being painted around us. Why? Because something amazing is going to happen. You see, Jesus Himself did not have to wait for some angel or some being or some miraculous thing for it to happen with the water to move. Jesus is the living water and where He went, the water was always willing to flow out. Now, the question is, if the water of life is flowing in you, do you keep a cork on it or do you let that water flow out so everyone knows the hope you have in eternal life of Jesus Christ? And here we see that Jesus steps into the scene. And there He sees these people that are blind, that are lame, that are paralyzed. And then it says they're waiting for the water to move. The sad thing is these people are waiting for something that was more superstition than they were waiting for a Savior. They were waiting for some miracle that happened in that water before they were waiting for a Messiah. This world we live in is waiting for something the sad thing is, is that many are waiting for little green men that come out of outer space than they are waiting for Jesus Christ to bust this sky wide open and return for His bride. How many of you saw on the news where they discover these little paper mache, I mean, come on folks, these little paper mache aliens, and they're like, oh, we have, we've got these aliens, and oh, and here they are, and one of the aliens even had uh, eggs inside of it. How foolish. Let me tell you, when aliens do make their presence known in this world, there will be aliens, but they're actually in the Bible, they're, they're called demons. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a demonic presence. And I believe the closer we get to the coming of Jesus, you're going to start seeing more and more deception, and you're going to start seeing more and more spiritual warfare, not behind the scenes, but you're going to actually start seeing it with your own naked eyes. There's a war that's raging right now between good and evil, light and darkness, and that we have been spared for much of that, 
but it is happening. And here it says that what takes place is that they're all there. They're waiting for the water to move. And the first one that gets in the water is healed. Well, isn't that convenient? That the one that probably didn't need the real healing is able to get up and get to the water before someone that really is crippled. I mean, come on. That's why I always think it's interesting if you were to go follow some of these fake TV uh, healers, and that's exactly what they are because I would challenge them. I would put up every penny of my life savings against any of them. If they're truly healers, then why don't they go to St. Jude's Camp Cancer Ward? Why don't they go to the other places that the people are dying and suffering? These little kids that have uh, cancer that, that has no cure. Why don't they go and show mercy there? Why do they wait for people to come to them and you plant that seed in their ministry. I'll tell you something, folks. It's just like this. You plant seeds and, and money into their ministry, the only person that's going to get a produce, a harvest, is that minister. Uh, that is just the way it is. So if you are buying into these fake Hitlers that are blowing on people, I'd hate to know my breath was so bad I'd blow on you and, and you just fall out. But um, if, you, if you're buying into that, understand this. Why don't we see follow-ups on it? These people that take their coat off and swing them around and hit people with it. I mean, you can go YouTube this and see it. I mean, they've made memes of it of Benny Hinn doing it. Uh, and I'm like, if that's the case, why aren't they doing it where people are really in need? Uh, one of the people I follow in ministry, and I actually talked to him on the phone, is a minister by the name of Justin Peters, and he actually uh, exposes many of these false TV preachers. And Justin and I were talking on the phone a few years ago, and he said that he's been, and, and Justin is actually, he has uh, a disease that is crippling his entire body, and he's been to those healing services, not to receive healing, but just to see how they would respond to him. And when they realize the condition he has is so severe that he's not even able to walk, that they say, well, let, let's shift to the side and get someone that just has an earache. Let, let's shift you to the side for something else. And he said he's been like eight Benny Hinn healing, and I say that, you know, comical, healing services, and every time he was not allowed to get up on the stage. Why? Because his condition was too bad. I want to tell you something. There is no condition that is too bad for Jesus. Amen. Uh, there's not. And the worst condition is, and every one of us in here have, is that we were once dead in our sins. And the greatest miracle is that He set us free. He, we were born again. And here it tells us that these people are waiting for some sign and wonder. And, and the first one that can get down there. So you like I said, it must not have been really too bad off, would be healed. And then the next verse it says, one man was there who had been sick for 38 years. How many of you know there's no verse, no numeric value, anything in the Bible that's there just by accident? I mean, it's not. I mean, you go read the Gospel of Luke, a physician, he gives so much details. But John, what is he doing? John, a fisherman, he, he wants you to be aware of the parallel of this. Now, Jewish readers of this text, automatically a radar goes off whenever they read what I'm about to read to you, and I'm going to show you a parallel of it. And then that way, when you hear this text again in the future, you'll be like, that's what the meaning is. Okay, let me give it to you real quick. The man had been there for 38 years. He'd been sick for 38 years, been lame for 38 years. No one was able to put him in the water for 38 years. He had nothing for 38 years. He was crippled. He was in pain. He was there. And what do we see here? It says he's been there all this time. And Jesus asked him that question. He says, do you want to be made well? Now the question is, do you want to be made well? And so my, my thing is this, why 38 years? Why didn't they just, the writer, say he had been there and been sick for a long time? Why the detail of 38? The detail of the 38 is because if you remember this Jewish writer by the name of John, what happens, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he puts that number in there to give you a parallel of Deuteronomy 2.14. Well, what is that, Pastor? Deuteronomy 2.14 tells us that the people of God, when they left Egypt, that they were punished because they did not believe the report that was given to them. They had to wander for 38 years. You said, well, wait a minute, your own pastor, they wandered for 40 years. No, they actually, they, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, 
But if you read the text, isn't that a marvelous idea to actually read the Bible? If you read the text, it says that they were punished into wandering for 38 years. Two years they were getting ready for the promised land. Two years for all that. But the 38 was for why? If you read that text I just gave you, Deuteronomy 2.14, it says because all of those men of fighting age had to die off before they went into the promised land. Now you say, well, why is the parallel between the 38 years and the parallel here? It's because God at that time while they're being punished in the wilderness, while they're wandering for 38 years, they are in hopeless state. They do not have true deliverance because they had not gotten to that place. They had chose to believe something that was not true and accept that they could not achieve what God had offered them. And because of that, they would remain in bondage in a wilderness area. This man who has been crippled for 38 years, he remains in that same spiritual state. It's an idea of pairing up the two of them together. And so what do we have here is that we have that even though he is at the house of mercy, remember Bethesda, he had not received the mercy. God was with them and wandering in the desert for 40 years, correct? 38 because of punishment, 2 years because of preparation, 40 years together. So He was with them, but guess what? He was also healing them. Their clothes were not wearing out. Uh, they had food to eat. He was taking care of them, was He not? Let me just go to this extreme. Whenever He delivers them out of Egypt, God didn't deliver them out of Egypt and those wandering, there was no blind person there. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because of the Bible, if you read the text, it tells us in the Bible that all were able to see what Moses was doing. All were able to see the work that was being done. We, last time I checked, you can't see if you're blind. Uh, and all were able to move and go. So there was a miraculous healing that took place, not only clothes not wearing out, but also that God was in the process of healing and fixing them throughout their journey. I thank God that He does that even for disobedient children. All right, let's continue. Some of you are getting it and some, I know, it's coming around the corner when, when, the, when it comes, right? And here goes. And so what we see is that parallel there. And notice that the question, do you want to get well? Well, why didn't Jesus ask everyone that? Well, because remember, they believed only one person could get healed. So what does Jesus do? He goes to the one that was the worst off, 38 years. He goes to the one that can know one to get him there. And Jesus doesn't offer to take him to the water that is not moving. He offers to bring himself to that man who is the living water. That's deep, for him, folks. Come on. And so what happens is Jesus says, Do you want why? Because Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He stands at the door and knock. He doesn't stand at the door and kick it in like some SWAT team and say, boom, we got a search warrant. We're here for, for you. No, Jesus is there at the door knocking, waiting for you and for me to say, come into my life. The sad thing is, is that we're so preoccupied with the things of this world, we are not hearing the knock on our hearts from the Lord. Are you with me? Let's continue. And so what happens is that Jesus asks the question and you might want to answer it yourself by saying, well, duh, of course He wants to get really healed. Really? He's had 38 years to plan for a way to get to that water. Does He really want to get healed? You know, there's a lot of people that some way enjoy pain and suffering and sickness. Some of us get more attention when we're sick than we do when we're well. Some people you know not to ask them how they're doing. Let, let's just keep going. But he says, I don't have anyone. Notice the man doesn't come right out and say yes, but he comes up with a what? An excuse. You ever invited someone to church? They don't say yes or no. They want to come up with some other excuse. The, the funniest excuses I hear when I invite someone to church is say, well, I go to so-and-so church, and I know the church. I say, oh. I said, well, who's the pastor there now? And it's always comical that people attend a, claim to attend a church but have no clue who their pastor is. Come on. And so what happens here? He says, I have no one to put me in. He gives all this, you know, excuses. And Jesus does not accept the excuse, but he offers him still salvation. Why aren't you saved today? 
You can come up with all the excuses and the Lord would still say, but salvation is still offered to you. And then it continues, it says to him, Jesus says these two words at the beginning, get up. You see, this man had to accept the idea that laying around had come to an end. Most folks in, in, in this time period did not live much longer than 38. Okay? And so when you study this, you find out that this guy, you know, he's already lived the, probably the majority of his life. I always think it's funny when guys are like 55 and they're like, yeah, I'm going through a midlife crisis, so you're going to live to be 110? Okay, that's, that's a whole other story. So here what we see is that Jesus tells this guy that's way past his midlife crisis, he says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now why is that important? Because he does this later in the scripture say, on what day? The Sabbath. Now, let me just break this down for you real quick. Two words, if you mark your Bible, this is a mark your Bible type of verse. Mark, you can see the word mat, pick up your bed or pick up your mat. That's one word. The other word is Sabbath. Well, pastor, what is the, what is the connection point on there? Y'all asking some good questions this morning. So let me give you the connection point. The connection point is what do you do when you lay on your bed? Okay, the answer is before anyone works anything out inappropriately, you go to sleep. This ain't a children's sermon, so just pay attention. You, so a bed is an imagery of what? Rest. Sabbath, which is the which commandment? Not the third, not the fifth, but the fourth. Remember, the little thumb lays down when, you, when we're doing it. I've taught y'all that before. So the thumb lays down, fourth commandment, Sabbath, right? So what is the Sabbath? It's all about rest. Let me do this real quick. So what happens is that he's saying to him, take up what you were laying on, roll it up, put it under your arm, and leave this place. So he's leaving with his what? He's leaving with what he was using as rest, but who did the healing? The Lord of the Sabbath, who is offering him true rest. Let me tell you something, friends. You might not have a, a sturdy, a sort of uh, bed. You might not have. You might your bed might come from big lots, and it's still got uh, wires hanging out. Of. You might not have the best rest at night. But I will tell you this: when you have the Lord, He offers you true rest. Amen. Are you with me? And so, what He does, He says, "Take up the mat." Take up your rest that you had, but I'm going to offer you true rest. The man gets out of there, and you would think everyone's excited, but it says those religious leaders, what happens? They're mad at the guy. Who told you to take up your bed? Who told you to take your, your rest and go? I don't know his name. And then Jesus finds him in the crowd, and he tells him who he is. And the man runs and tells, and all of this is going to be kind of like the domino effects. Guess what they're going to want to do? Because when they question him, he identifies himself as the Son of God. He identifies himself as God in John chapter 5. So this will be the triggering point in which the dominoes will start falling that they'll want to put him to death. I wrap everything up by saying this. Today... Don't go to water that's not moving when you have the living water, Jesus Christ, who is moving. Don't go to a church that is dead and the water is stagnant because, my friend, you'll get nothing out of it. Go to, to a place that God's Spirit is moving. And how do we know it's moving? Because the Word of God is being proclaimed. Amen. Are you with me? Okay, that's the first point. Second point is, is that how many of you have been doing your own rest Oh, my, some of y'all been resting mighty good because I've seen you when I'm preaching. Uh, you've been resting. Resting place. During Ken's sermon. Okay, come on, wake up. You need to wrap up your rest that you have in the world and you need to accept the rest that Jesus offers. Take up your mat, get up, and go. Only five, You might say this, Tanya, come on. Only, and people say Jesus was like the, doing a lot of Sabbath healings and, and doing all this and breaking the fourth command. Let me tell you this, Jesus is the fourth command. Amen. Right? He is. He's the fourth command. Another thing I want to let you know is that Jesus Christ, 
being the Son of the most living God, is offering us this. When we are saved, we enter into His rest. We enter into it. Today I encourage you to get up and go knowing this. You have a peace about what's happening and that salvation is yours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Third miracle. How many times did I had to go to Jerusalem? I had to go up to Jerusalem how many times in the year? Three times at least. There's so many things happening there. 38. Why 38? Because it reminded the Jewish people of the 38 years because they did not believe they had to remain wandering for 38 years in the desert. Nothing in the Bible is there by accident. Everything's there as a puzzle piece. We just have to take the time and energy to connect the pieces. And when you do and you step back, you know what you see? Jesus offering you salvation. Let's pray.